Monday afternoon edition of Cover to Cover. I'm your host, Denny Smithson, and I am delighted to have in the studio with me today a very wonderful guest uh, who's bitten a who's bitten who's written a book that reeks of knowledge, um, <clears throat> years and years of experience uh, in the world of uh, energy and learning how to save it. Uh, David Goldstein is here. His book is called Invisible Energy. Strategies to the to rescue the economy and save the planet. It's published by Bay Tree Publishing here in the Bay Area. Um, David is the uh, um, energy program co-director for the Natural Resources Defense Council. He's also a MacArthur Genius Award Fellow. Genius in quotes. Um, I don't know if you did that or, or they did. Because we all hate the word genius. <laughs> I, know, I know. I knew you did, but I had to throw it in there. I just had to. Um, we discussed his last book, uh, which was titled Saving Energy, Growing Jobs, on this program in April of 2007. Welcome back, David Goldstein. I think where you began and get you to tell us your role uh, in making refrigerators more energy efficient in, in California beginning in the early 1970s um, and just how much energy has been saved as a result. I, I, there's not enough you in this book and I'm going to bring that out today. I want to know more about, you know, your personal actions and, and what you know, what you can point to and say, yeah, I helped do that. Uh, well, thanks. Everyone likes to talk about themselves. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't do it much in the book, though. And I thought that was deliberate, probably. Um, it, it might have been yeah. just the way I write. Yeah. Uh, but first of all, why do we care about refrigerators? Refrigerators were the biggest single use of electricity in the home when I got started in this area in the mid-1970s. So if you could do something about refrigerators, uh, you were on to something big. Not only that, but the energy use of refrigerators was growing at a compound rate of 9.5% per year. So that's a doubling every seven, eight years. So a pretty dramatic problem for the environment. Uh, nobody really had been looking at the growth rate at the time. The whole residential sector had been growing at about 9.5%. And all the experts thought, well, this is just going to continue that way forever. Uh, I don't think anyone went through and asked, well, what would the consequences be? Because if you looked at how much energy it would take to power refrigerators by today, if we had continued that 9.5% growth rate, which everyone believed in in the early 70s, we would be using 200 gigawatts. That's almost two times our entire nuclear power plant fleet in the United States doing nothing but powering home refrigerators. You've got to distinguish between efficiency, which means getting the same energy services, getting that big convenient refrigerator if you want it, getting one that defrosts itself if that's what you want. You don't have to give up anything. What you're doing instead is relying on the engineers who make it and the product designers to come up with something that costs less to operate and works just as well or even better. Well, now, what does that mean? Does that mean insulation? Does that mean a better engine? Um, and when, what role did you actually play in bringing about these changes? Well, it means a lot of things from an engineering point of view. And it really isn't environmentalist's job, or the government's job for that matter, to tell manufacturers how to design a refrigerator. What manufacturers can do best in a market economy is if the government gives them a goal and says, we don't care how you meet it, but here's what we want you to achieve in the bottom line. So in the 1970s, uh, I worked with the California Energy Commission and uh, uh, many other people to try to look at how much better were some refrigerators that were already on the market than others. And alternately, if you added more insulation or improved the compressor, how much difference would that make in energy use? So we had a good basis to decide that refrigerators ought to be able to use 30% less energy in a couple of years than they did in the mid-70s. Mm. The key thing was making sure that it happened, and we did this in California by requiring the manufacturers to produce these improvements in efficiency before they could sell the product. Well, I've been working since I left Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory in 1980. I've been working for NGOs. And even before that, I was working with uh, Environmental Defense Fund and NRDC as a consultant. So really what a big part of this success was, 
uh, was the um, open uh, administrative forums in California and the Northwest that would allow people who thought they had a better answer than conventional wisdom to be able to present that answer to decision makers and hopefully get some kind of decision based on the merits rather than the special interests or the politics. Energy itself is invisible. Uh, energy is not like other consumer goods in the sense that you can't eat it, you can't play with it, you can't watch it, you can't drink it. So energy is just useful to the extent that it provides other consumer services that people like. So energy can uh, power a car that will get you where you want to go. Energy can run a computer so that you can talk with your friends over Facebook. And what people are really interested in is the energy service. Now, you can provide any energy service using a lot of energy or using a very little. And the difference between the two is invisible. Um, I'm an amateur photographer as a hobby, and I wanted to do my own cover art for this book. So I was trying to think of what would I take a picture of that would show energy efficiency as, as a theme. And I was stumped. I couldn't find anything because the point is the efficient device looks exactly like the one that isn't efficient. So what are you going to show? Yeah. Energy is invisible. Oh, well, I may not have the art, but at least I have the title. But what are the limits of energy efficiency? I, I, you, you say that we've already, um, we're already saving $830 billion a year in the United States because of policies that have been implemented. What kind of limits are we talking about? How much can we save? Well, we don't actually know the answer to that question because we find whenever we try that we can do a lot more than we thought. Uh, whenever we've tried to uh, save energy through efficiency, we've always found that we've run out of political will or run out of budget for incentives before we've run out of opportunity. So I note in the book how uh, the the conventional scientific wisdom, the National Academy of Sciences, the American Physical Society, uh, the business community through McKinsey and Associates Consulting, have now pretty much agreed that we can save 30% of what energy use would otherwise be in 20 years through measures that cost a half to a third of business as usual and provide the same or better energy services. What this book is really about is saying those studies were based on very cautious, overly conservative, and conservative isn't even the, the right word for it. Uh, they're, they're based on lowball assumptions. And what we really need in the public dialogue is some statement of how far do you think we could go if we really tried, as opposed to how far do we know beyond any reasonable doubt that we could go uh, with things that we've already done before. A 30% reduction that conventional wisdom says is possible, that would hold energy use constant in the United States instead of growing, which it's been doing for 150 years. But all of those studies are based on really trying to answer the question, where could you go in 2030 using 2007 technologies? I mean, imagine if Microsoft is asking those questions. Imagine if a computer manufacturer is asking those questions. So I tried to reframe the issue of how much progress could we make technologically in efficiency if we overcome the failures of the market and can achieve the same kind of success across the board that we've already achieved with refrigerators or with heating and cooling in new homes here in California. And, and by the way, these are areas where we haven't tried our hardest for 35 years, we've, but at least we've tried a little. We've tried intermittently. And, and that gives you a completely different answer. That says, depending on how much we can um, encourage new technology and innovation, we can get by on a third, maybe as bad as two-thirds of today's energy use with a vastly expanded economy in 2050, more population in the United States, and a higher level of energy services while we're still paying a lot less than if we had done business as usual. We're talking with David Goldstein. The name of the book is Invisible Energy, and uh, you can probably find a copy in any good local bookstore.